this seminar is sponsored by the Infant and Early Childhood Development PhD program at Fielding Graduate University. Um, you can look at our programs by uh, clicking onto our website at www.fielding.edu. You can also feel free to tweet about the conference at why, uh, hashtag Y0-5 and hashtag child development. Um, the recorded 0-5 to five conference will be posted on Fielding's YouTube site um, that's listed in this slide. And you can contact us um, for further information if need be at the following address. And I will post this on the chat uh, when we're finished. Beth, there's an S in front of my email, just to let you know. A what? Oh, there is an S? An S, yes. Okay, sorry. So it's S. S. McMahon, that's fine. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking today about the sensory motor function in zero to five year olds and particularly covering research um, as a key to intervention. We're going to examine the clinical implications of sensory motor deficits in young children. Um, I'm Beth Austin, uh, and I am a pediatric occupational therapist. Um, I've been in practice for longer than I'd like to say, <laughs> over 40 years. Uh, I, have a, I own a large multidisciplinary clinic in the Chicago area, and I'm uh, an expert uh, trainer in the DIR floor time model. Uh, Sarah, why don't you introduce mm -hmm. yourself? Okay. I'm Sarah McMahon, and I'm a pediatric physical therapist. Um, I've been in practice for uh, 28 years, and I also own a uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary practice in um, Houston, Texas. Um, I'm a graduate student at, in the uh, Fielding uh, Graduate University, and um, I am a uh, I speak on a variety of topics in uh, pediatric physical therapy, um, not only the DIR model, but also the NDT model, um, aquatics, um, SOS feeding approach, um, so a variety of different topics associated with this population of zero to five. Okay. Uh, just before we start, Jenny, did you hit the record button? Uh, yes, I did, it's recorded. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, the developmental process is quite complex and it involves uh, the interweaving of a variety, a number of converging influences. Um, we of course come uh, packaged biologically with a genetic makeup and this determines things like our sensory reactivity, our processing capacities, muscle tone, and things like that. Uh, but our biology is greatly influenced by our experience, uh, both prenatally and postnatally. And so development unfolds within the context, not only of our own biology, but of our parent, the parenting patterns that um, are at play, uh, the environment and cultural practices. Um, so what's happening when a baby's uh, in utero? Uh, we know that sensory processing begins before birth, and by 10 weeks gestation, the fetus is responding in a global way to tactile stimulation by moving away from the stimulus. By 18 weeks, the fetus responds specifically to touch by withdrawing the part touched. And by five to six months, the fetus moves to reposition if it's uncomfortable and begins to practice movement patterns that are seen after birth and that will help in the birth process. By eight months gestation, the fetus responds to sounds outside the womb and will remember familiar voices and sounds. In the third trimester, the fetus begins to develop in response not only to the internal environment, but to external envir the external environment as well. So it's taking in information that surrounds the mother um, and uses that as part of the developmental process. And some external stimulation is needed in order for, um, for the fetus to continue to grow and for all of the sensory systems to develop. The only exception to this uh, is vision, which develops later and continues to develop after birth. Um, external stimulation, however, has to occur in appropriate sequence 
appropriate intensity and appropriate form, both prenatally and postnatally, if it's going to be uh, advantageous to the developmental process. Uh, too much stimulation, too intense uh, stimulation, and uh, chaotic stimulation, both in utero and postnatally, is not good for the developing child. This has particular importance when we think about the care of the preterm infant. So at birth, the infants are neurologically ready to interact with the sensory world, um, and parents are critical for making this process tolerable. Uh, infants require interaction to thrive and help them craft a flexible and adaptive nervous system. And we know from um, the experiences of, uh, of nurturing infants post-World War II and from the experiences of infants in, uh, raised in orphanages where the physical care was good, uh, the lack of interpersonal um, uh, attuned caregiving uh, impacted uh, the development of, of babies quite severely, even to the point of causing death. So uh, we know that we have to have a, a caring, nurturing human environment for the newborn, as well as uh, just physical care and nurturing. Um, babies and parents are packaged to interact. So even before birth, both the mother and the for father are homo harm are hormonally primed to take care of their baby. Um, and so when the baby is born, they're ready to um, lock onto uh, the characteristics of the infant that help them attach and nurture, to their, nurture their baby. We know that newborns produce cry melodies that follow the rhythmic and melodic patterns of the language that the baby heard while it was in uh, the womb. And we know that babies recognize familiar voices um, and the mother's smell from their experience in the womb. Uh, we know that babies can imitate uh, both the melodic contour of their mother's speech, uh, but also some facial expressions of the parent. And these are used in early interaction. Uh, the baby can focus on objects eight inches away, which uh, coincidentally is the distance from the breast to the mother's face. And babies are born with recognizable facial expressions that um, are known the world around. Their emerging motor skills support social emotional development and shift the nature of the uh, social emotional interactions as the baby becomes more motorically capable. So the newborn is quite incompetent, but as the baby gains motor skill, it has increasing ability to contribute to the interactive process and as a result, um, the nature of the interaction has to shift. Sarah, would you like to take it from here? I will. Um, so at, when the infant is born, uh, maturely, as Beth said, they're dependent on the adult caretaker um, for their, their head control, their postural control, the movement of their limbs. Um, and the, the baby is really wonderfully made um, for this, um, this early caregiving and, um, uh, and, and for this whole process of, um, uh, of, of moving from the development of dependent to independent um, uh, movement and, and person. Um, so when full-term infants are born, they are born in this, uh, what we call the physiological flexion, where they have um, slight rounding of the shoulders, um, the elbows are flexed up, the hands are often curled, the, um, the hips are, are curled in, and the knees are all curled in. And this serves many purposes, um, one being it, it really places the baby in a, a position of already being able to fight gravity. Um, quickly after a baby is born, the gravity acts on the infant, and the infant goes into a more extended type of posture. But right from the very beginning, before they're strong enough to be able to do that, we have this physiological flexion, which allows the baby to bring hand to mouth um, for calming. Um, it allows the limbs to be um, in midline for visual exploration of, um, of both their, uh, their hands and even sometimes their feet as they start to bring their feet up to their, their mouths and explore with their hands. Um, it really allows the baby to really conform to the handling of an adult caretaker. Um, if, 
you've worked with um, or, or seen premature infants, they're in a slightly more extended posture because they haven't had that time in utero. And your ability to really hold and have that baby conform to your arms and to your body is just a little bit more difficult um, to be able to get that, that, that real um, the snuggling kind of position. Um, and that, but that physiological flexion really brings the whole thing together. Um, and then that, that motoric incompetence that we talked about at the beginning, it really necessitates that physical contact. So we really, that infant and that caretaker, there has to be that close connection together to be able to have the infant thrive. So I wanted to touch on at this point, um, really the whole concept of uh, movement and what it means to us um, as, as functioning uh, human beings. I think that um, movement has been a little underestimated um, and the impact on um, the whole um, developmental process. Um, it's a little overshadowed by um, uh, by social emotional development and language development, but really understanding the whole concept of movement um, can really give us key into um, what's going on internally and neurologically. And it's really the first thing that babies are capable of. So I wanted to go through um, that a little bit. Um, this is a quote by Alfred Adler as early as 1931 um, in his manuscript, What Life Should Mean to You. And it states that in every movement of the body and every expression and symptom, we can see the impress of the mind's purpose. A man moves, there's meaning in his movement. He moves his eyes, his tongue, the muscles of his face. His face has an expression, a meaning. It's the mind that puts meaning there. So really what he's saying is that the movement is really the only way that we have of really knowing what's going on internally. Um, and when I've stated this to people before, they kind of, well, there are other things, but even facial expressions, movements of the tongue, any other expression that allows us to understand what's going on internally is all some sort of movement that the infant is doing. And so by analyzing and looking at movement, we can really have a window into the mind of, of, of a child. So the purpose of movement, um, neuroscientist Dan Wolpert um, in a TED lecture proposed that we have a brain as human beings for one reason and one reason only, and that is to produce adaptable and complex movements. Movement is the only way you have of affecting the world around you. And I feel like this is a very important concept to understand that the only way that we have of really acting on the environment, reacting to the environment, interacting with the environment is through movement. Um, again, in, in uh, Alfred Adler's manuscript, he talks about um, the reason that a plant doesn't have a brain. And um, he said, what's the purpose in knowing that you have maybe a, 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 a predator come or a rabbit come to eat the plant and the plant can't move? So there's no purpose in thinking about something that's going to happen that you can't react to, that you can't cause any movement, you can't um, act upon the environment that you're in. So that gives support to the fact that we have a brain for movement. All right, we can go on to the next one. So when we think about posture, um, posture is a leading factor in all of behavioral development. Um, movement really develops on the background of this posture. All of our, as physical therapists, we always talk about gaining stability to be able to get mobility. We have to be able to have that stable posture to be able to move our limbs, to be able to get control of our head and our eyes. Um, when I, I work with children with cerebral palsy, and um, if you see a child with a lack of postural stability, even if they're ambulatory, even if they are walking um, down the hallway, but you ask them to gaze in a different direction, that um, causes a loss of balance in many situations, unless you've really worked on that, 
central postural control to be able to handle all these nuances of movement that you have in your limbs and in your head and in your eyes. The integration of the body and movement uh, is necessary for all of these interactive processes. Um, Travathan talks about the um, that movement um, enables the embodiment of affect, um, not only through vocal reciprocity and attunement of facial expressions and gaze, but through the attunement of bodily actions and gestures. And um, when you see an interaction between two people, um, and you really analyze the movement that's going on between the two, you can tell so much about what they're feeling inside, just about the way that they're positioning their body, the way how close they are to the person, how far away they are from someone, without even knowing what their speech is, what, knowing what their, their conversation is. You can tell so much about what they're feeling and what's going on with an interaction just through that um, back and forth of their, their body, bodily reactions and their gestures. Um, and this coordinated movement is so necessary to all of our social interactions and our social pragmatics. Um, when we think about real time understanding of what's going on with another person when we're having an interaction, you need to be able to recognize and, um, and understand what's going on with that other person through movement. And then you need to be able to, in real time, react to it and make it make sense to that other person that you're having an interaction with. And that can be a very difficult dance to play with if you have any types of um, difficulties in being able to read bodily movements or you have difficulties yourself in any kind of bodily coordination. Um, that timing and that rhythmicity and that attunement just, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't go into harmony and you have a very fragmented type of interaction. Um, keep going. Yeah. So then we get into the, um, the dual coding of, um, of affect and movement. So we're talking about these neural systems that, that are set up for the infant um, that are really responsible for the activation of the, these rhythmically attuned actions um, and that they're able, they retain this, the, the temporal, the, uh, the time and the space aspects of the event to be able to allow the infant to participate to be able to read that other person, to be able to react to that other person. Um, and this may be tied to some activity of the mirror neurons. That's a big um, topic uh, recently of these mirror neurons that allow us to really mirror the, um, the, the movements and the affect of um, the person of our interaction partner and our communication partner. Um, Trevathan also describes the dual coding of the affect and the movement um, and the critical role of these neural systems for that, the organization of the movement and the goal-directed um, intentional action. And then just a you know, word about the dual coding. Um, when we talk about dual coding of, um, of, move, of affect and movement, um, an example would be a infant that um, whose mother just ended an interaction and moves away, and um, the infant is feeling like they want that feeling to come back again. They want to be able to have that happiness again, and so they create movements and they try working some movements to be able to get that um, that partner to come back to get that that feeling back again. Um, and again, in the baby's world, it's not this conscious, um, I'm going to do this to be able to get mom back again. It's more of that feeling of, um, of, of what's going on in their environment and being able to practice with different vocalizations and, um, and different movements of their body to be able to make that affect either happen or not happen. Um, there's a, a book by Dan Stern that is a baby diary, and it's really about the infant um, and not necessarily what they're thinking, but what they're feeling during infancy. And it's, it's, almost, it's, a, it's almost a hard read at times because it's very raw 
as far as what that, all of these, these feelings and these sensory experiences that are coming into this infant um, to be able to uh, then express itself in uh, the movements that they're developing at the time. Go ahead. So um, this is a, a video of a, just a wonderful interaction. Um, so I'd like to, to play it once, and then I'd like to play it again. And um, so let's play it once. Okay. Um, and, and I'd like to play it again, um, but this time I'd like us to really focus on the movement piece. I think the first time you watch this, it's easy to get very caught up in the beauty of it, um, very caught up into how just wonderful this interaction is, um, how attuned it is, how regulated it is. But now I really want to take a step back and I want to look at the movements. I want to look at the facial expressions. I want to look at what the mouth is doing. I want to look at that reciprocity of how that infant is really responding to the mother through, um, through the, the, that movement aspect, what the arms are doing. So let's just look at it one more time from that perspective. This is a beautiful example of synchrony in terms of the timing and rhythmicity within the interaction. Mm -hmm. You can almost see those mirror neurons at work. You can see the mother's head going up and down, and you can see her head going up and down as, um, the, as she just looks at the mother. You can see she, the mom takes a little kind of gasp and goes back, and baby does the same thing and moves her body in the same way. So it's a really just looking at the neural systems that are going on and how organized this interaction is. It's really beautiful. So how does sensory processing and integration affect movement? Well, we can go back to um, the origin of sensory integration to Jeannie Ayers. Um, she describes uh, sensory integration as the brain's ability to organize sensory input for the use and functional behaviors. So it's important to understand um, from the very beginning, sensory integration was really about the organization of the sensory input and how that integration is used to affect the environment for functional behaviors. Um, so the term sensory processing, um, it reflects the taking in of the sensory information, that modulation of the information, not too loud, not too soft, not too heavy, not too, too light, um, the integration, how all of those are working together, and then the organization, what comes first, what comes next, what, what is gonna be the most important, less important of sensory stimulation. And that all results in this adaptive environmental interaction that we observe for movement. So that's the behavior, is the movement. Um, and so that, again, that modulation piece, how our movement is affected by that. And the modulation is not only um, the modulation of movement itself, so how fluid we are moving um, through space, but also that modulation of um, how attentive we are to, um, to a, an interaction that's taking place, how, um, how we are emotionally ready to be able to um, engage in an activity or um, an interaction. It also um, touches on the postural control piece that we talked about earlier, our postural control of, um, of how stable we can make our bodies and how fluid we can move our extremities and the rest of our body on top of that, um, that stable uh, posture. 
and then a uh, praxis, and that is the um, creating an idea of movement, being able to decide in your brain how that movement is going to occur, and then the actual execution of that movement, the actual production of that movement. So this is a slide that um, I thought was important to have in here, but we're not gonna go over it in detail. But for, um, for those familiar with sensory processing disorder, um, these are really the areas um, that are important or, um, or have an effect on the whole concept of sensory processing disorder. So we're looking again in the modulation piece, which is the responsivity um, piece of, uh, of sensory processing. Um, the motor-based disorders, which is the praxis that we talked about in the postural uh, control that we talked about earlier. And then the discrimination piece, which is really the ability to um, uh, to take in, register the in, in sensory information um, and know um, accurately um, what the, the uh, how strong it is, how um, loud it is, how close it is, um, and really be able to discriminate um, that sensory information um, uh, from other, other information that's going on in the environment. Beth, you might want to say more about that. Oh. Maybe not. Well. <laughs> No, I, I just, there are, um, this uh, is a, um, a look at sensory processing from, the, from a standpoint of looking at the underlying processes uh, rather than the end products of sensory processing. And um, it's, uh, this model takes a disorder um, uh, approach, but you could look at this from the standpoint of, of a developmental um, function perspective as well, that, that um, in order to have a good sensory processing, we have to be able to modulate and discriminate sensory information in order to organize and execute action. Um, so uh, the reason I like this model is that it lends itself to more, uh, to a greater developmental understanding of uh, sensory processing disorder. Uh, and that's a whole other topic, so <laughs> for another day. Do you want me to take it, Sarah? Um, yeah, yes, I think you take it from here. So the idea is that motor skills uh, don't develop independently of sensory experiences and perception, but they, they're integrated together. And there are a number of different um, uh, theories that come into play in terms of this integration of motor skills within the total and more global developmental picture. And so you could look at things like synactive theory, dynamic systems theory, and uh, Greenspan's functional emotional developmental capacities as part of that whole process of, of uh, sensory uh, processing and movement. Our, our, our sensory systems uh, consist of many different areas which work in a continuous feedback loop to regulate and make sense of sensory information in order for us to function. And if we take a look at those uh, sensory systems, we have on the left the usual big five, which is vision, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. And those are the most obvious senses, but we also have at play our vestibular system, which uh, processes movement within the inner ear, the proprioceptive system, which um, takes in sensory information from the joints and muscles, and um, even more importantly is the interoceptive system. And this is the system of, of sensation that occurs viscerally when we're hungry, um, when we're full, when we um, have a full bowel or bladder, or uh, the sensations that arise that, that um, as part of affect. So when you have a feeling, um, an emotional experience, you feel that in your body through your interoceptors. And this acts um, very strongly on your autonomic nervous system. But it's a, it's a sense that you can't see. So for many of the kids that we work with, these internal sensations are powerful because um, we can't always ascribe uh, a source or a cause for the for the reaction that we're getting. You may see a fussy baby, for instance, who's having reflux, and so they're in, experiencing an internal sensory experience that we can't necessarily um, uh, identify a cause for. And this happens a lot with regulatory disorders. Um, Sarah, do you wanna talk about this a little bit? 
I can. This is a, um, I, I really wanted to include this because um, I know that um, we're really looking for the neuroscience to support um, a lot of what we do um, as, as therapists. And this was a, a research study that just came out um, this month at the University of Geneva. And what they did, and this was a mouse model, um, but they discovered this genetic lingua franca, um, or this common language um, of our sensory systems. So basically what it says is that um, uh, for what they looked at, which was tactile, visual, and auditory systems, the genetic expression um, early on was um, very similar or the same um, before it, it actually developed into other systems. And, um, but they maintained that common genetic language that they have. And so that really speaks a lot to um, when we think about the coordination of our, our sensory system. Um, and people, I think, have this concept um, that you are either hypersensitive in your visual system, um, you're hypersensitive in your auditory system, that you have this, um, that one system over the other is responsible for some kind of deficit. But really, we talk about how they all work together because there is this common language. And if somebody is speaking Spanish and the other person is speaking French, well, they're not going to connect and they're not going to experience things the same way. Um, and so we are now supporting this through, um, through neuroscience, that there is this common language between our, our sensory systems. Um, and the point that um, one of the researchers makes is that in the mice model, this took a few days um, for this to develop. But in human beings, this could take several months um, of, of development um, in, as humans develop in a, a much longer time. And we're also very sensitive to our environment. So it really speaks to the fact that early on for even in utero and early infancy, how affected we are by our environment and how we have our gene expression to be able to support the harmony of those different sensory systems. I think the other thing that comes to mind is the idea that, you know, in traditional sensory processing theory, we tend to think of it of things system by system. But in reality, we never have an experience that is single uh, sense. Um, all of our, our sensory experiences are multi-sensory. And so this coordination and common understanding is essential for us to really, um, to be able to synchronize that sensory information into meaning. And for a lot of the kids that we see, there is a lack of synchrony, a lack of coordination um, and common language in the sensory systems that cause a dissonance within the, within the child. So this is a video of a, of a typical toddler and um, I, it just gives you an idea of how complex and how beautifully exquisite uh, sensory processing and motor function is when everything is working right. So I just want, when you're looking, when you're looking at this video, I just want, um, want you to really look at her postural support in this video how she is moving her head on top of her body, how she's um, switching her gaze between activities, and how she's really handling the, the, um, the, the environment that she's in during this experience. Um, the other thing is that the fluidity of her movement is the one thing that is missing in so many children with developmental disabilities. I want you to pay attention to how easy it is for her to shift her, her gaze and her posture to include her social partners. And we're going to talk a lot about this when uh, we talk about children with developmental differences.
good, Sarah? Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, it's just beautifully uh, mm -hmm. fluid and complex, and uh, she just modulates a wide range of what could be overwhelming stimuli to another child. And how she's really able to modulate herself, and even when she gets into the position of, okay, it may be a little bit too much now to be on my feet, so I'm going to go down, I'm going to get a little bit lower, and I'm going to make myself a little bit more stable so I can handle all of this that's going on. So she really innately knows what to do with her body to be able to continue on with this enjoyable um, interaction environment. And what's important to remember is that all of this happens automatically. She doesn't stop and think about each thing, although she may be uh, drawing uh, information about the meaning of the stimulus around her, the, the movement is in the background, it's not in the foreground. It's, it's in the background in service of her overall function. Um, so movement develops on a background of posture and it's the posture that maintains the body in a stable position against gravity and it's that stability that allows for distal control of the head, eyes, and the limbs. And so you need a system where you have um, underlying stability, but mobility has to be overlaid on a stable base. Um, stability without mobility is not functional. Um, the, the body, uh, the fluidity of this uh, interaction of stability and mobility, um, supports the in interactive process in that it allows the child to use social gaze. Um, social gaze is action-based and so it's dependent on emerging motor control and postural capacities of the infant. And when you saw how um, fluidly she was able to look up and around uh, to find uh, the, maybe the father as he came toward the dog, that's something that we don't see in children with developmental disabilities. Um, the fluidity of being able to access the social partners and emotional stable base um, is critical for the development of affect regulation, social interaction, um, social referencing, joint attention, and the development of language. And so movement underlays um, uh, and is important for a foundation for attuned and co-regulated interactions with adult caregivers. Children with developmental challenges often have motor deficits and as a result struggle with the social piece um, and as a result may also have difficulty with affect regulation. So there's a link between motor um, functioning and motor uh, capacities and social capacities that support um, affect regulation. So now we're gonna look at what happens when things go awry. Um, and we're gonna look at developmental differences in sensory and motor development. Um, Sarah, do you wanna talk a little bit about this? This is just a good example of one of the uh, things we often see when uh, things aren't going right. Mm -hmm. So how old is this baby? Uh, gosh, I believe he's about 15 months in this video, somewhere between 12 and 15 months. And we are working on um, his motor skills. Um, that's why he is, is at the clinic. But you can see that there are so many other things going on with this child. And that if you can't get a regulated system, you really can't work on anything. There is no amount of, of um, interaction that's going on with their, this child. There is no amount of learning that's going on with this child because he's not even able to really regulate that emotional system to be able to open himself up to these other areas. Hey, hey, hey Mr. Simone. Oh, I am. Hey, how old are you, Mr. Simone? Oh my goodness! And Simone's how old? Fifteen months old? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We're going to get a 
gonna get up a hug. We're gonna get up a hug. We got this. So you can you can see that there's really very little ability for him to actually calm himself or to make those uh, 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 the, the, any kind of attempts to, to calm. You can see even there was a small uh, moment in there when he was still being held that he stopped crying, but you could still see the distress on his face. You could still see the, his, his facial expression and everything else that was going on, and he really just couldn't keep everything together. Um, and I don't know if you heard, there's another um, uh, client in the room at the time, and um, she says at the very beginning, I don't like him. And um, she's making, she's very distressed herself. And that really speaks to that ability to have any kind of interaction with others when you're in um, this, this state of dysregulation, that it really affects every aspect of, um, of your, your function. And you notice when he was down on the ground and the caregiver moved around, he swiveled, but he couldn't find the caregiver's face. He was following the movement of the caregiver's legs, but couldn't find the face. And it's through the facial exchange that um, babies experience co-regulation. So um, when we look at sensory motor challenges, we need to look at um, comorbidity and shared symptoms. So if you think about um, autism, uh, dyspraxia and sensory processing disorders, anxiety and regulatory disorders, ADD, dyslexia, learning disabilities, language disorders. There's a huge overlap um, between uh, symptoms uh, in one diagnosis and symptoms in the other. And so um, when we're looking at uh, sensory motor issues, we're thinking about kind of this broader picture and the overlap. Um, for instance, it's, it's unusual to have a child who has ADD who doesn't have other issues, or a child with a language disorder that doesn't have some type of a sensory motor challenge, or a child that has regulatory differences and, uh, and um, doesn't also have motor issues and sensory issues. So again, um, the sensory motor issues that we see lie at the core of a lot of these different developmental diagnoses. Um, sensory motor deficits are indicators of differences in brain architecture. And it's this difference in brain architecture that impacts the dynamic functions of the brain networks that underlie the various developmental diagnoses. Um, the sensory motor systems usually appear before full-blown diagnostic symptoms and can act as early indicators of vulnerability to developmental glitches. And there's just a flood of research coming out now on uh, this idea that the sensory motor systems um, are early markers of later, more complex developmental disorders. Um, several of these concerns can be identified as early as three to six months, and I would say even earlier. Um, those of us that work with preterms, uh, preterm infants, uh, can identify things in the first few days of life and. Uh, some of these things continue to be pervasive um, it, a, as the child develops. Um, and while these issues in the early months don't necessarily mean that there's going to be a downstream developmental disorder, they certainly warrant close follow-up and may aid in early identification of concerns and allow for monitoring of emerging processes or problems that are associated with later issues like autism. And one of the things that just breaks my heart is when I get a family in uh, who has had to live for two years with a child that's irritable, for instance, because of reflux. And as a result, they have differences in their motor functioning, their sensory functioning, their, their um, interpersonal connectedness. And all of the time that the parent was being told to wait and see or that they would grow out of it, the parent has a growing dis-ease that something is wrong. And they're not getting support early on. And this in and of itself is devastating um, to the parent-infant um, connection. So um, we're going to look at another video. This is a baby um, who's just showing some disorganization. And Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about the baby? 
I can. Um, so this is um, this actual this video was was given to me as kind of a fun video that um, somebody showed me. It's like, oh, look how much fun um, this little girl is having. And she is, I think, about five months in this um, this video. Um, and then as I was talking to the parent, I said, oh, and I see that disorganization. And so she was, what are you talking about? And um, so these are just, this just shows the, the subtle signs of that disorganization and those things to be looking for. We saw little Simone who was more of on the fussiness, you know that he's disorganized, you know that this is going on, but these are more of the subtle signs. Get up closer. Get up closer, Larson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get mom and laugh at you. Okay, just hit it again to stop it if you want to. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, she's got the hiccup. <laughs> Hey guys. <laughs> I think she likes you, girl. Okay, Laura, shake the other one. Switch with your hand. Might... Just... Um, <clears throat> so this baby, um, the hiccups are a sign of stress. Um, and uh, yes, it's cute, but no, it's not. You can see this baby struggling to maintain her posture and her head control. Um, she's, uh, she's not very stable and um, she starts laughing and then just gets overwhelmed and starts hiccuping and that's the body's way of starting to shut down. Um, this is a very dense slide, um, but it, it, it's from uh, Elizabeth Torres's work and what it, it does is show you kind of the complexity of the, the nervous system and the fact that we have, um, uh, uh, autonom an autonomic nervous system and a somatic nervous system that serves uh, our, our motor function in, in different ways and our sensory systems in different ways. And that breakdown can occur at all of these different levels. Um, and so uh, a breakdown in one area of function is going to create a breakdown in other areas of function as well. And the movement occurs on a continuum from unconscious and involuntary to voluntary and conscious. And much of what happens um, is, is occurring actually at this lower um, level of processing that's less conscious, it's more automatic, it's, re it's spontaneous, it's reflexive uh, or habitual. And it's not until we get into a uh, fairly sophisticated movement that we have voluntary awareness and voluntary control of our movement patterns. Um, so developmental issues in children, um, uh, motor issues in children with developmental disorders are pervasive and they're very complex in nature. Um, and uh, the motor deficits are more and more being recognized as playing a central role in um, the developing, um, uh, the developmental unfolding of children um, with developmental disorders. In other words, early motor issues have implications for downstream developmental outcomes. Um, there is research that suggests that the more pervasive the motor deficit, the worse the prognosis, especially for children with ASD. And difficulties with postural control in children later diagnosed with autism are evident as early as three to six months. And now there even, uh, there's even some research that suggests that you can see these sensory motor differences um, in utero. And again, because of, of epigenetic effects, um, having the propensity for those patterns doesn't mean that it's going to determine the outcome, but it does signal that we need to have some type of an early intervention and an early recognition to shape the um, experiential context of the child in order to assure more positive um, outcomes. So things that we see, we see problems with muscle tone, we see problems initiating movement, and that's the affect to movement um, connection. 
We see constricted patterns of movement with poor adaptation around task demands. So the baby may have a limited repertoire of movement. We see lack of rotation. We see lack of um, this fluid and dynamic movement as they transition from one position to another. Uh, motor execution and coordination can be impaired. And um, oftentimes children will have difficulty understanding and applying force. And this has to do with um, the understanding and awareness of proprioceptive feedback. And we also see problems with ocular motor control. Um, and the, the, interestingly, the eyes are often um, looked at separately from the motor system. And yet in order to move your eyes, uh, you have to have movement. Um, and so looking at some of the ocular issues that occur in developmental disorders, especially autism, um, also has to be done within the context of the overall um, movement of the child. Um, autism is uh, a developmental disorder. Um, and I, I emphasize developmental disorder because uh, even in the current DSM, it's considered a behavioral disorder. Uh, but more and more autism is being recognized as, as having developmental roots and foundations. And at the core of that motorically um, are disorders in the timing and the efficiency of three types of prospective movement. In other words, uh, movement that is uh, involved in um, acting on the world. Um, so we see difficulty producing single actions, for instance, extending the hand to point. Uh, we see difficulty organizing series of actions needed for complex tasks, um, which gets into sequencing and praxis. And we see difficulty with the coordination of multiple action patterns required for functional movement. And these are projection action sequences. So this would be something like um, a child sitting on the floor and um, knocks a toy away and they have to rotate and get onto their hands and knees and maybe rise to their feet to move across the room to get it. So that type of coordinated uh, postural and movement pattern um, is often an issue for children with autism. And these movement patterns may start very early, as I said before, and possibly even prenatally. Um, children with autism have very uh, distinct movement patterns that indicate disruptions in the, uh, the movement feedback systems that calibrate the motor system. Um, so when this is uh, some of Elizabeth Torres's work and her work is very complicated and dense, but basically um, as we develop, we come to have an understanding that if I'm going to reach for a cup, I'll see if I can do it. If I'm going to reach for a cup and the cup's right here, that I adapt as I, as I am approaching and I stop at the right point and there's a sweet spot in space that I come to know and anticipate. And children with autism have difficulty calibrating their actions to find that sweet spot. So they go to do something and they, they are in the wrong place. They haven't calibrated correctly and so they have to reset. And um, there's this lack of being able to kind of find that sweet spot for um, um, for projected action sequences and, and prospective movement. And so as a result, their attempts at self-discovery through movement and their ability to adapt um, around task demands and to have goal-directed actions are impaired. Um, and this, all of these motor issues serve to disrupt um, the interpersonal and interactive movements with the caregiver. So in other words, the child is now dyssynchronous. They aren't predictable. They aren't able to, to sustain patterns of back and forth interaction that support that shared social timing that's necessary for connectedness. And Beth, I also wanted to talk about that interaction also with their peers as they're getting into the later ages. If they're not able to calibrate those, those movements, if you think about an interaction where a child is wanting to catch <laughs> up with a friend when you're playing tag, and because you can't calibrate your system to be able to stop behind the other child, you end up pushing into them and pushing them over. Well, that sets up a, hey, why did you hit me? 
and, um, and it sets up a negative interaction, whereas that wasn't the intention. It was that that child wasn't able to calibrate their system enough to be able to, um, to adapt to what was happening in front of them, and that it ends up putting this negative twist on an otherwise nice, friendly interaction. And unfortunately, we see that frequently um, in our, our toddlers and, um, uh, and, and, and older children um, when they, they have those peer interactions that are really misunderstood. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really true. And um, it, some of what happens along with that, not only do they miss the mark and become uh, overwhelming, sometimes they can't even figure out how to join or to get in. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happens is that when we're with people, um, we, we start to share uh, our timing with them. And there's a, a rhythm that's established in interaction that allows us to predict the other person and, and thus uh, regulate around the actions of the other person. And what happens with uh, kids that have timing issues is their movements are unpredictable and they're strange. And so um, the other person isn't able to develop that shared social timing in order to be able to know what's coming next in the interaction, nor does the child with a difference have that capacity. And so there's just this continual social mismatching that happens. And, and um, the result is that neither party is regulated. We're constantly in co-regulation with our social partners around this timing. Um, and as a result, um, regulation is impaired, language is impaired, and, and also the nonverbal aspects of language, pragmatic language, is impaired. Um, children with autism often appear to lack central organization of their body movements and patterns, and they lack fluidity and predictability, which is what I just um, talked about. So um, it's difficulty to maintain uh, resonant patterns within inter interaction. Um, and then in autism, uh, the ability to monitor yourself and others are involved, um, as are the capacities to transition among different interstates. And so, because children um, with these differences can't co-regulate with a partner, uh, they don't develop patterns of and, and predictability of how to soothe and calm themselves and to be able to regulate their own internal states. So this is a baby um, that I worked with for um, actually only about two and a half years. Uh, it was a little girl that was born into a family with four brothers and the oldest brother had ADD. Uh, the next brother had Asperger's and a bipolar disorder. And the, the brother, oh no, there were three brothers. Um, the, the child next to this one was um, autistic and had uh, full-fledged um, symptoms of autism. So when this little girl was born, the family was ecstatic because of course autism is less common in girls than boys. And by three months, the mother was in a panic and nobody would listen to her. She knew something was wrong. She could tell from the way that the child was interacting and the child had incredibly intense sensory needs. So in order to be calm, she had to be facing away from the mother and either bounced in a really heavy rhythm or swung in a very wide arc um, in order to calm and then as the mother would turn her toward uh, her to interact with her the baby would arch throw herself back um, and the process of dysregulation would continue and these were long screaming fits um, by the time she finally got to me at eight months uh, she she was uh, not sitting up uh, her rolling was inconsistent she had repetitive uh, was beginning to have some repetitive hand movements that involved banging um, she had a strong preference for objects over people and a lot of difficulty with postural control that, that looked like she didn't want to be held. So we'll look at some of this. It's kind of a long clip, but I want you to, to sort of observe some of the things that I've talked about, and then we'll see how the mom tries to get her engaged. Oh, she's in a bouncy chair because we wanted to be able to give her vestibular stimulation while having a face-to-face -face position, but she didn't like the chair, so you're going to see that. She's getting tired. I'm getting tired. Don't take her out. Yet. She's getting tired. Are you tired? Are you tired? Go, go, go. 
Go, go, go. So mommy make this a game. Pat on her tummy a little bit though. Yeah. So at this point you see the arching, the ambiguous facial expression, um, the squealing that isn't really communicative. Um, the mom said when she hears that sound, she doesn't know if it's going to be um, a happy smile or a tantrum. Um, and it's, it's hard to get into a rhythm with her. Speech. Imitate her speech, Mom. Good. Do it again. So sort of reflect how she's sounding. Ask her if she wants to get out if she's upset. Damon, do you want to come out? Damon, do you want to come out? Out. Yeah. Okay, so now start to take her out. I'm going to stop it there and kind of move it ahead, but um, we finally got her calm. Um, and in the end, um, I'll just show the beginning of the engagement with the mom. And the mom was finally able to get some reciprocity with her. It took 17 minutes. Um, this is very edited, but it took 17 minutes from the start of that tape to this point in the interaction for the mom to get this baby engaged. Um, it was very painful that for this mother. Uh, she was um, depressed. Uh, it was hard to sustain. Um, but once the mother figured out that the baby needed to be stabilized, her posture um, fully supported, and that there was a set distance from the face that the mother needed to maintain, she worked on engagement and reciprocity, and we saw a very rapid turnaround in both her social functioning and her motor functioning. Um, it was a really interesting case, and um, she's now a typically functioning uh, middle schooler. It was uh, an exciting case for me to follow. Um, the early motor signs that we see, um, postural deficits in children having um, ASD, we see asymmetry, postural asymmetry. We see abnormal muscle tone, um, primarily low tone, but with um, areas of postural fixing that can result in higher areas of tone. You see this a lot in kids that are toe walkers. So they have a really unstable core and yet they have just whopping legs um, because of, their, of the way that they stabilize their posture. Um, we see atypical or absent writing reactions and this little girl had a lot of issues with that. Atypical rolling using a lot of arching and flopping the head over as opposed to using writing reactions. We see asymmetry in sitting and creeping. Um, there are delays in transitional movements, for instance, from lying to sitting, sitting to prone, 
uh, prone to stand, uh, I mean, uh, sit to stand. And we see delays in the development of mature sitting and walking postures. So these kids sit and they walk, and sometimes they sit and walk on time, but the patterns that they show are atypical and immature. Um, and then we also see asymmetry in their lying and sitting postures. One of the most um, interesting pieces of, of research that's come out in the last few years is um, from the group at Johns Hopkins. Um, and they found in siblings of children with autism that later developed autism was that this group of children had head lag when they were pulled to sit at six months. Um, and then, of course, there are delays in some of the milestones, but interesting milestones are not good markers of the type of motor disorders we see in kids with autism. So here's an example. This happens to be a nine-month-old, but this is an example of head lag on pull to sit. And um, you can access the tapes from uh, Johns Hopkins on YouTube um, by uh, Googling um, Rebecca Landa. really marked delay in head lag. Uh, usually uh, we don't see that past the first, I don't know, certainly not past the first six, eight weeks of life, uh, but, but maybe even sooner. Sarah, do you want to say anything more about that? Sarah? Um, this child would, did end up um, being diagnosed with a, a genetic disorder, but I, I just wanted to, um, you know, comment about um, the early signs of motor delay. Um, this took such a long time for diagnosis for this young man, um, and it was really attributed to this and that, and, um, uh, and I really was... Um, uh, really adamant um, to the doctors that um, this was something more and um, he was showing all of these motor signs but because he was happy and he was laughing and he was socially engaged um, they there weren't the concerns um, that um, I think should have been there right from the very beginning so um, so I, I, I think that the early diagnostic piece um, is important to understand when you're watching videos like that. Okay. Um, so, uh, the other thing that, um, Sarah, were you going to talk about this or was I? I was going to talk about this, uh, the postural control and, um, and praxis. So we talked a lot about that postural, postural, um, control piece and, um, and uh, Beth had stated before that in children, um, that were later diagnosed with ASD that we, we see. Um, fewer spontaneously initiated changes in posture um, and being able to organize your distal extremities and your eyes and your head on top of an unstable base um, can lead to that lack of, um, of, of refining your movement um, during, during your first year of, of growth and development. It really is all about gaining that posture. Um, so we even see with children who have had um, reflux, who never spend time on their stomach, um, that you really have that, that difficulty 
in, um, in, in really getting the transitions and um, getting the strength to push themselves up into a quadruped position. And everything kind of builds on each other. So you have that lack of, of postural control. You have that lack of ability to change postures and to transition for movement. And then you get that lack of exploration. You get that lack of exploration and you get that inability to really move throughout your environment. Um, so everything kind of plays into the next piece. Um, and those are all um, opportunities for learning and, um, and, and social interaction. And so when that's disrupted, um, and, and again, it may come from that postural support piece, but it's all that flow of, of how that postural instability can affect all of those different areas. Um, I think I spoke to, and the difficulty of posture control and head and arm movements, it impacts the efficiency of the reaching and the pointing and um, the giving to the other person. When we um, looked at that videotape of the, the young girl at the beginning that was handing things to, um, uh, to the other people in the room and how um, really uh, fluidly she was able to handle her posture and turn her body and be able to hand it to another person. Um, versus uh, falling over if that happens, or maybe handing something but not looking at them because they can't handle that. And then it's like, oh, well, you don't have eye contact and control, you don't have the social piece. So it all kind of works together, um, but may stem from um, one, one control of movement. I think the, uh, one of the key points here is that, um, that the postural control provides the foundation for early language development. And so the, the head turning for social gaze, the reaching, the pointing, the giving and showing are all key components of initiating and responding to joint attention. And um, these are critical um, for the development of language. And oftentimes we, we tend to separate language development from motor development and yet uh, the very foundations of language occur um, at, a, at an early motor level. So here's a little guy. It's a, it's a very brief video, but it's a, it shows the connection between postural control and motor planning. And um, do you want me to show it and then Sarah, you can talk a little bit about it? Let me set it up just a little bit. This uh, little guy is actually over a year old and he's not crawling yet. He came to us through our feeding clinic at six months old. Um, he was um, having problems transitioning um, from the bottle. Um, we did discover through the feeding clinic that he did have reflux. He never spent time on his stomach and he was very fussy. And um, they lived about an hour away, um, really couldn't come to us on a regular basis. But then when he was not sitting at nine months old and he was not um, walking obviously at 12 months old, even crawling at 12 months old, is when they decided to come in for, um, uh, for regular intervention and, um, and coaching. So um, yeah, let's take a look at him. So it just shows you that I'm even trying to support him. Well, immediately when he comes out out of that prop sitting posture, he leans against my leg. So he's trying to find that stability um, in his posture, even to begin to think about interacting with the toy that I have in front of him. And then I try to impose movement on him, which is a mistake, uh, because he's not able to really <laughs> anticipate um, what my hands are doing. And so he gets a real resistive type of, um, of posture because he's not ready for that. He doesn't have the postural stability to really be able to handle the transitional movement that I'm trying to put him through. And he's not able to anticipate what I'm doing to him. So um, not only does he know in himself that he can't handle it, but then he's having to try to figure out what I'm trying to do with him. And he really can't handle that, um, uh, that imposition of movement on top of him. Okay. Um, so just uh, to kind of wrap up quickly, um, because I know we're kind of getting out of control, um, there is a high correlation between manual dyspraxia or motor dyspraxia and verbal dyspraxia in autism. 
And um, again, those manual motor skills underlie the three most important measures of early social communication, which are nonverbal requesting, um, initiating joint attention through pointing and responding to joint attention through social referencing. So, um, you know, I think we, um, I feel like, I feel a press to uh, wrap up here. Um, uh, I don't, Jenny, should we go on or should we wrap it up? Beth, do whatever you need to do, okay? All right, well, let's, let, we can get through this quickly. Um, uh, the, the key points here are that these early behavioral markers of autism don't really appear until, the social and behavioral markers don't really appear until about 12 months in an obvious way, um, while um, the, the motor markers can appear as early as three to six months. Um, at six months, um, children at risk for autism did show, however, marked passivity, again, the motor pieces at play, um, decreased activity, um, again, a motor issue, and extreme distress, which has implications for co-regulation um, they have also had difficulty with prolonged fixation on objects. And at 12 months, this translated into decreased eye contact, poor visual tracking, difficulty disengaging from visual attention on an object, difficulty orienting to their name, social smiling, social interest, and differences in reactivity. The thing that was interesting in looking at the, the research on behavioral markers is that uh, despite the fact that there are significant motor underpinnings to these behavioral markers, an association with motor functioning was not even considered in these studies. Um, <clears throat> Feldman has talked, as others have talked at length, about the timing and rhythmicity of movement within social interaction and difficulties of that with autism. Um, less motor activity in the first six months in children was paired with fewer vocalizations and shortened periods of interaction and at risk under 12 months. And this created a dyssynchrony that interfered with parent infinite interaction. In other words, these slow to move babies that were less vocal were not as robust in their parent infant interactions. And um, differences in parent infant interactions between six and 10 months that were due to this lack of activity predicted poor ADOS scores. Um, so motor skill performance may not be the best indicator of the underlying motor deficits in autism and motor skill performance was not a predictor of ADOS scores. However, praxis was a significant predictor of um, total ADOS scores and composite scores in each of the areas. So motor planning seems to be a key component that's at play. Um, and that's underrepresented in the way that we look at the motor problems associated with developmental delays. <clears throat> Most developmental assessments look at motor skill acquisition, but not the qualitative and quantitative aspects of movement that we've been discussing. So things like muscle tone, postural control, and motor planning are not part of many of the, the current developmental and motor assessments that we use. And there are very few sensitive qualitative measures of motor function that have strong predictive validity for long-term motor outcomes. Um, so sensitive early motor measures with strong predictive validity are needed that can capture early motor deficits and the potential and potential related processes. There are two currently available measures that we want to talk about briefly. Um, uh, that, how, we're, that do have good predictive validity for later outcomes and capture these qualitative aspects. Um, one, um, you want to talk about the GMA and I'll talk about the TIM? I can. Okay. Um, the, oh, go ahead. Now, the general movement assessment is a, um, an assessment for um, infants. Um, it was created by Hans Prechtel um, and has uh, continued through his trust to be developed. And there's actually quite a bit of research um, that is going on currently using the general movement assessment. And, and basically, it's evaluating children uh, using videotapes of their movement, and it focuses a lot on um, their their movement patterns and their uh, uh, their their positive movement. And so, you're really looking at not only the 
the, the fidgety movements that the children are making, which are a positive thing. Kids have um, these fidgety movements, but also the, um, the, the quality of these movements and how many of them they make. Um, and so there is um, quite a bit of research that has, um, uh, has looked at the predictive validity of the general movement assessment for um, later diagnoses of cerebral palsy and other neurodevelopmental disorders, just according to looking at the quality of the movements as infants. Um, there was a study just done um, this year um, uh, by the, the practical cohort that um, it looked at the um, MRIs um, with a general movement assessment and the TIMP, which um, Beth will be talking about, and really correlated the, um, the MRI with um, the findings on both the GMA and the TIMP. Mm -hmm. um, the TIMP is the test of infant motor performance, and this is a, 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 a motor assessment uh, for uh, babies 32 weeks up to four months of post-term uh, age. Um, I was one of the co-developers of this instrument, and um, it has really strong predictive validity for motor outcomes at a year, um, at preschool age, and also into the school years. Um, it, it also, um, uh, well, the TIMP contains uh, several of the, of the movement patterns that are included in the GMA. Uh, we, the TIMP looks at uh, fidgety movements, oscillating movements, and ballistic movements as part of the assessment. But it also is a very comprehensive assessment of the quality of movement uh, that's involved with organization around the midline and the emergence of writing reactions um, and postural control. So it's a really strong test. However, it, it, um, it really is designed for children under four months, and the GMA, I think, was designed for even younger children. Uh, these fidgety, ballistic, and oscillating movements um, disappear once the motor system becomes calibrated uh, to some extent. And so there's a gap between these two instruments and what we could use in, in uh, the years leading up to, um, I would say, up to two or three. Uh, we're, we're, we're lacking good qualitative uh, measures of movement. Um, so what does the research suggest? It says that motor development in ASD may, be a, may play a central role in understanding the pathological progression of autism, including possible links between motor development and social communication. Motor issues are early symptoms that are often overlooked. Motor symptoms appear before social and language systems, so if you wait to look for those, you've waited too long. And early motor markers, while they don't necessarily mean ASD, it's inevitable uh, is, that ASD is, is going to happen. Um, early motor markers do warrant close follow-up and monitoring. And early motor and sensory concerns have many downstream effects for social engagement, regulation, language development, and higher level motor development as well as cognition. And very early intervention can mitigate, mitigate many of these downstream effects. So getting in early may serve to avert um, the unfolding of an autism diagnosis or may lessen the impact of uh, the developmental concerns in autism. And then parents are the most powerful interventionists when they're skillfully coached to carry out treatment. Relationships are really the glue. And so these movements unfold within the context of relationships and I feel need to be treated within the context of relationships. Um, I'm a, a big proponent of the DIR model and the use of that, uh, of, of floor time techniques within uh, my discipline specific work as an occupational therapist. I would say Sarah probably would include PT in that as well, and uh, speech is also done within that model. Um, treating the sensory motor issues in isolation is not going to serve the larger developmental problem. It's critical to intervene in ways that keep in mind the integration of movement um, in the total developmental picture. And so a developmental approach rather than a discrete trial approach is probably more effective in these very early years. And motor intervention should be addressed within the context of social emotional functioning. So not only looking at um, 
where the child is motorically, but how does their motor function serve the unfolding of their social emotional capacities for regulation, engagement, the ability to stay in a rapid flow of reciprocal exchanges, and social and motor problem solving that support the growth of representational and symbolic thinking. So that wraps up um, our talk. And um, if uh, we have any questions, I'd, we'd be happy to answer. Yay! Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't have any questions, but I appreciate your presentation and all the great information. <laughs> I'm so sorry it didn't work. I'm, I, <laughs> I've never really experienced that before, and I use Zoom a lot. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Marcy, for hanging in there with the late Sure. <laughs> Did you have any questions, Marcy? Um, I don't, but I appreciate all of the information that you presented. Much of it was familiar, some of it newer, but um, I'm familiar with the work of Elizabeth Torres and the DIR model and um, one of the um, folks that I share cases with is an infant mental health specialist so I've, I've um, become familiar with this information over the years and I see it affect downstream as you say in the school age population I work with yeah all right well thank you thanks again thank you, everyone absolutely that was absolutely fascinating.